In this video, we're going to be looking at space-time diagrams. So we're going to start off by looking at graphs. Now look at the axes on this graph here. We've got your regular y-axis and your regular x-axis. Nothing too controversial there. Notice that the axes are at right angles to each other. Um, this is the way that you've probably always drawn graphs. And we can label it. We can maybe make this 0, 1, 2, 3, etc. We could say minus, minus 2, minus 3, and so on. Likewise, we can do the same on the x axis. So there we go, just a regular graph. Now, what if we wanted to plot a point? Let's say we wanted to plot the point, I don't know, just for sake of argument, 3, 2. Well, we would move 3 along on the x axis and we would move 2 upon the y and we would plot our point somewhere there. So hopefully nothing too controversial there. What I want to show you now, though, is another type of coordinate system or type of graph paper. Now, it's very confusing at first when you look at this. We've still got two axes, only they are not at right angles to each other. But the question is, do they need to be at right angles to each other? Let's just do the same process we did a moment ago. So I'm going to label this zero. This is one, two, three, and four. And I could carry on with minus one, minus two, and so on. And likewise, we could go a zero here, and we could talk about one, two, three, and four, and minus one, minus two, and so on. So it's the same idea, only when we think about it, that because they're at different angles, it just looks a little bit strange. Let's try and plot the same point again. In the last one, we plotted 3, 2. So let's see if we can plot 3, 2 again. And what does it look like here? 3, 2. Well, let's go 3 along the x-axis here. And then we're now going to go 2 up on the y so that it looks like this. So we can see it's still possible to plot points, only you have to admit it's a little bit different. It's a little bit strange. If you can get your head around that idea, if you can become comfortable plotting things when the graph axes are at right angles and when they're not at right angles, that is your key to understanding space-time diagrams. The real test, of course, is can you use both axes at the same time? Now, when you first look at this, obviously, it's extremely confusing. So you need to keep a very clear head. Let's try and do the same thing again. You can see that we've got the green axes there, which is just your regular axes, which are perpendicular to each other. And then we've got the black axes, which was the one that we changed. Now, let's try and see if we can plot the same point again. So we're going to plot 3, 2. And let's see how that works. Notice 0, 0 is the same for both graphs. So that point is absolutely the same. That will have a significance a little bit later on. Now what I want to do is plot 3, 2 in each of these systems and show that it actually appears in a different place. So let's go with the regular system first, where they're perpendicular to each other. So we've got 1, 2, 3 along here, then 1, 2 up, and we would plot our point there. Now let's try the same with the other axis. Now it can be very, very confusing when you look at this, but let's work with it. We're going to go one, um, two, and three, and then we're going to go one and two. So can you see that the same coordinates, three, two, look different in one system than they do in the other? A lot of what we do in space-time diagrams is comparing one system where the axes are skewed to the other system where the axes are perpendicular to each other. So now we're back to the regular sort of graphs. Now, what I want us to think about now is a displacement time graph or a distance time graph, actually. Displacement time graph or a distance time graph. 
Now, you're familiar with these, you've done these um, um, for a while now. So we usually put displacement somewhere here and we have time here. And we know that if we get a steep line, that obviously indicates something going very quickly and we get a shallow line, that means something going slower. If something was stationary, it would have the horizontal line. Now, I think everybody's okay with that, so I won't dwell on that. However, what's important to note is that when we do space-time diagrams, what we do is we change the axis. So we're used to having time going along the bottom. Now time is going here. Now we're going to have displacements going along the bottom. I'm going to call it X, okay? Just more comfortable to call that X for displacement there. So now let's have a think about what these lines mean. So if we have a very steep line now, that means it's going slow. If we have a shallow line, that means it's going fast. So it's the opposite of what we're used to. Now, one thing that confuses students is in space-time diagrams, we don't actually just keep the y-axis as t. What we're going to do is we're going to multiply it by c the speed of light. So we've got ct against x. Now, if you think about it, ct is actually a value for distance there because it's a speed times a time. But don't worry too much about that. We're just going to do ct as the y-axis. Now, this has an advantage for us. Look, we were saying a moment ago that speed is the um, inverse or the opposite of the gradient. It's one over the gradient of the graph. Well, let's just see what that looks like now. So if I choose, let's say I wanted to find the gradient of this line here, obviously I can do the rise over the run. But let's look what that gives us. That gives us C T over X. But we're saying if we want to work out the speed, we want one over the gradient. So one over the gradient is going to be X over X. CT. Now look what that does. That actually gives us x over t times 1 over c, which is another way of saying v over c. Now this is extremely useful because it means when we do 1 over the gradient to calculate the speed, the speed comes out as a fraction um, of the speed of light. So it might come out as 0.2 or 0.3, meaning that it's 0.2 or 0.3 the speed of light. Well, in relativity, everything we do has to be moving comparable to the speed of light. Otherwise, relativistic effects don't work. So by putting this here, multiplying it by C, it has a really useful effect in that any speed we calculate when we do 1 over the gradient comes out in terms of C. We can go further with this idea. Let me draw a line and this line, we'll talk about the names of these lines in a moment. But let's just imagine that we could have angle theta here. So it's the angle between the line, the name of the line actually is called a world line. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But the angle between the world line and the CT axis, so the time axis has now been multiplied by C, is often referred to as theta. And what we can say is that tan of theta will equal v over c. So why would that be the case? Well, let's have a look. We know that we could make a right angle triangle here. So we could make a right angle triangle and we could label the parts of the right angle triangle. So we've got obviously the right angle here. We've got theta there. So we've got the opposite and we've got an adjacent there. So tan theta is going to be obviously the O over A, the opposite over the adjacent. Well, that is the inverse of the gradient. That's the, the one over the gradient, isn't it? That is the speed. And just as we said a moment ago, it's the speed in terms of C. So we can talk about being one over the gradient, or we can talk about tan theta, because the opposite over the adjacent is 1 over the gradient, which is the speed in terms of the speed of light, C. 
a very important line to think about is the line that's at 45 degrees. Now, I should say that this means that the axes have been labelled um, with the same scale. So let's say, for example, if we label this as 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on, and we did the same here. So what is the significance of a 45 degree line? Well, a 45 degree line would pass through 1, 1, it would pass through 2, 2, and of course it's going to pass through 3, 3. We'll go back to what we said about tan of theta equaling V over C. I think what we talked about the gradient and the inverse of the gradient equaling speed. Well, what would this gradient represent? If we were to draw a line that goes through all of those points like that, then what does that represent? That represents the speed equaling the speed of light. So there's a limit on our diagram. Remember, nothing can go faster than the speed of light. So this line is not permitted because it is shallower, therefore it is faster than the speed of light. Of course, this line is permitted because it is smaller than the speed of light. So what about other lines? What about the significance of some other lines? Well, let's try some here. What about if I was to draw this line like that? So we've got ourselves a vertical line there. Well, can you see that the X coordinate never changes? So we can say that this object, this person, this thing, was in the same place, so the X coordinate didn't change. However, of course, they moved through time, and that's what we're seeing with the um, vertical line there. Now, let's try another line. What would this line mean here? Well, as discussed before, this line is just something moving through space and moving through time, and therefore we could calculate its, uh, its speed and so on. What about if we get something stranger? What if we get a curved line? What would that represent? Well, just like it would on a regular displacement time graph or a distance time graph, that one would represent um, some change in their velocity, which would represent some form of acceleration, okay, speeding up or slowing down. What's very interesting, though, is what happens if we consider a line like this? Okay, well, what does that actually mean? That line, it shows that time did not change along that line. So that's talking about events that are happening simultaneously. But we'll get to that a little bit later. Okay, this is where space-time diagrams start to get very, very interesting. So you're going to have to keep a really clear head as you go through this. So have a look what I've drawn here. I've got those two graph papers. If you remember, we had the one that was perpendicular and the one that's not perpendicular. Ignore the one that's not perpendicular for now. Just concentrate on the green one. We can see that we've got a axis, a CT there, and we've got X there. So that's just a regular diagram. Now, ignore the other one for now. Now, what I've done is I've also drawn a world line here. So I've drawn a world line, which is something moving through space-time. And you can see that we've got this red line. So there it is, the world line there. Now, what does that mean? Well, according to the person whose axes are the green axes, remember we're ignoring the other one, well, we can see that something is moving through space and moving through time. We can see that it's got a certain steepness, a certain gradient. We know that one over that gradient would give us its speed in relation to the speed of light. Okay, the thing that makes space-time diagrams interesting is that you can actually draw other observers' perspectives on this graph. So what I've tried to do here is we've got the green axis, which is the person who's stationary, and according to them, there is an object that is moving along that world line. Right, what if you were in the frame of reference, what if you were in the inertial reference frame of the object that's moving? 
So if you're in the frame of the object that's moving, according to you, the object is not moving. You are stationary, it's everything else that's moving around you. So how do we draw that? How do we draw the inertial reference frames of the object that's moving? How do we draw their perspective? Well, look what I've done here. I've drawn a new set of axes. I've labeled this one CT dash. I've labeled this one X dash, just to differentiate it from any of the, the other ones. Now, look what I've done. I've skewed the axis. Look at the CT dash axis. Can you see that I've skewed it in such a way that it is parallel to the world line? So the world line is the same, but my axes have changed so that it's parallel to it. I've made the axis skewed. I've rotated the CT axis and I've now called it CT dash. I've rotated the X axis and I've called that X dash. They are still symmetrical because we want the middle line to be the speed of light. But just have a look at the world line. Follow what goes on in the world line from the perspective of the second axis, the skewed ones. Look, what happens is that the world line begins at X dash equals one. But all the way through this world line, which according to the people who have got the green axis, it's moving, according to us, in the other axes, look all the way through, if we follow it, its position didn't change. It was always at one. Can you see that means that from the perspective of the axes that are skewed, there was no movement. We are in the frame of reference of the thing that is moving. Now you might want to pause the video and really think about that for a little while. Now let's take a look at the relativity of simultaneity, which means that two events can happen and in one inertial frame of reference, those events were simultaneous, they happen at the same time. However, from another inertial frame of reference, they're not simultaneous. So we've learned about that in, in your lessons, I'm sure, but what this is now is a way that we can show that on one of these diagrams. So what I've drawn here, I've drawn two events. It doesn't matter what those events were particularly, but I've drawn two events and I've called them A and B and I've put them on the space-time diagram. So let's consider these two events from the perspective of the green frame of reference. So in the green frame of reference here, we can see that both these events happen at time, or rather C times time is equal to two. We've got this line here. So these two events were simultaneous because they happened at the same time, according to the, the, the green perspective. Okay, now what happens if we have a look at the other person's perspective? Let's have a look at the one that's been skewed a little bit. So we can have a look at the times that happened there. Well, look, it looks like event A seemed to happen, we have to follow the timeline back, seemed to happen at time two. So pretty similar to, to what the green axes thought. But look when B happened. If we follow B back, B actually happened at looks like around about 0.5. Can we see that they did not happen simultaneously according to people in the black frame of reference? For us here in the green one, absolutely, they both happened at the same time, which was two. But for us in the X dash or the CT dash um, perspective, they were not simultaneous. So this is the way that we can show that simultaneity is actually relative. It's not the same for all observers.